This study is part six of our study of Revelation six of the seven seals. This is the opening of the sixth seal. Our scripture is Revelation six verses 12 and 13, which reads, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken by a mighty wind. Revelation 6, 12 and 13. The seven seals of the book of Revelation represent the seven stages through which the Christian church uh, will go through. And uh, we've been studying that and have found that there is a parallel between the seven churches and the seven seals. Seal number one is the same time period in the Christian church's history as is prophetically represented by Ephesus, for instance. So now we're on the sixth seal, which parallels the prophetic application of the sixth church of Revelation, which is Philadelphia. We also learned that the seven seals of Revelation 6 parallels the seven churches and that the first four seals are the four different horsemen riding different colored horses. Each time period was different from the others. The first phase of the Christian church was the apostolic period because it was during the time of the apostles when the gospel spread to the four corners of the then known world from 31 AD at Pentecost to the last apostle, who we believe is John, died in 100 AD. The second phase of the Christian church is represented by a rider on a red horse, which is a period of persecution of the believers from 100 to 313 AD. The third horseman was a black horse. The phase of the growth of the Christian church was from 313 to 538. On the positive side, this is the time when our Bible, as we know it, was complete for the first time. But the church allowed corruption, compromise, and false doctrines into the church. The fourth stage of the church is represented by the fourth seal, which is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. This pale horse and rider symbolized the portion of the Dark Ages from approximately 538 when uh, Rome started coming into power to 1517 when the Protestant Reformation began. The fifth seal represents the period of the Christian church under the persecution during the Dark Ages following the Protestant Reformation. This period started with Martin Luther and others. Uh, in, in 1517, Martin Luther challenged his Catholic Church uh, until the Pope was taken captive, uh, then the Protestant Reformation ended approximately in 1798. So we had a chart last time that showed the fourth and fifth seals and how the 1260-year prophecy in the book of Revelation paralleled the fourth and fifth seals of the false doctrine of the fourth seal and the Protestant Reformation of the fifth seal. But this chart now expands to show that the sixth seal is after 1798. And so even though these dates are a bit fluid, uh, the point is the, the seals are in a sequential order and the sixth seal is after the fifth seal as shown on this chart. The first event that is mentioned in the description of the sixth seal is a great earthquake. We'll look at this verse again. And behold, when, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun, the moon, blacks, black as sackcloth of hair. The, the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell on the earth, and so forth. Well, Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 that these events would happen in quick succession prior to just immediately before the second coming. 
Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, which we believe the tribulation is the time of trouble, uh, another word for it, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall give up her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then shall appear the Son of Man in the heaven, when, when, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you can see this, uh, the sun getting darkened and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling from heaven are, are things that will happen quickly in succession just before Jesus appears at the second coming. Notice the timing, that the tribulation, uh, which again is the time of trouble when the plagues and all that's going on, Jesus is talking about here is Jacob's time of trouble. So these events will happen dur during the deliverance of the 144,000 at the end of Jacob's time of trouble. We've studied this previously and uh, shown on timelines how that works. Joel 2 in the Old Testament talked about this as well in verse 30 to 32. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be delivered. So even in Old Testament prophetic times, this was foretold as well as New Testament in Matthew 24. But the first of these signs have already happened uh, in order before or after 1798 approximately. So even though we, we know from what we've just read that immediately prior to the second coming, um, this is going to happen in a global way. But there have been some events historically that have happened in the same order. And we're going to take a look at those. These historic fulfillments of these first signs appear to have happened in the areas where the gospel was being spread, as you will see. 266 years ago, one of the biggest earthquakes ever in modern history was registered in Lisbon, Portugal. It was reported to have uh, been about... Uh, 8.7 to 9.0 earthquake. This resulted in a 65-foot giant tsunami. <clears throat> By comparison, we all remember in 2011, the earthquake in Japan and the tsunami that happened. That was one of the strongest earthquakes in modern recorded history. This earthquake in Japan was an 8.9. The final estimate of dead was about 20,000 from this Japanese earthquake and tsunami. Remember that number, 20,000. Here's a video clip of some eyewitnesses of this tragic event in Japan. <laughs> あ、そうです。何の。あ、そう。when the Great Lisbon earthquake happened, it was much worse than the Japanese earthquake and tsunami of 2011. You see, it was the 1st of November, which was a national religious Catholic holiday in Portugal, and a large amount of people were in churches with lit candles for mass when the earthquake started. People ran to the, to the river as it was the most open space in the city. And that was when the tsunami hit. At the same point, 
the candles that were lit in, in the churches are believed to have fallen and started the massive fires. Remember the Japanese earthquake and tsunami had 20,000 people die. It is estimated that the, uh, the Great Lisbon earthquake had 90,000 people dead. It was a bright, clear morning, and most of the population of Lisbon was celebrating Mass. The first inkling of what was to come came at approximately 9.30 in the morning. Reverend Davy wrote, I was sat down in my apartment, just finishing a letter, when the papers and table I was writing on began to tremble with a gentle motion, which rather surprised me, as I could not perceive a breath of wind stirring. Christian Stockgaler, the consul of the German city of Hamburg, said, First we heard a rumble, like the noise of a carriage. But then the noise grew. It became louder and louder until it was as loud as the loudest noise of a gun. Immediately after that, we felt the first tremble. At 9.40, all the church bells started ringing. Accounts vary, but the shaking lasted between three and six minutes. Modern estimates are that the quake had a magnitude between 8.5 to 9 using the moment magnitude scale, releasing, in essence, a thousand times as much energy as the 2010 Haiti earthquake. The first great shock was felt over an area between 1.2 and 1.4 million square miles. The shaking was felt as far away as Finland and North Africa, Northern Italy and the Azores in the Mid-Atlantic. According to author Mark Molsky, the earthquake released 475 megatons of energy, the equivalent of 32,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs. He noted in an interview with National Public Radio in 2015 that it was the largest earthquake to hit Europe in the last 10,000 years. Davy observed that with regard to the buildings, it was observed that the solidest in general fell the first. Massive stone structures have little flexibility to absorb shock. The churches and cathedrals full of parishioners collapsed on themselves, crushing the people inside. The sky became as dark as night from the clouds of dust and debris. A significant aftershot hit around 10 and more buildings crumbled. The streets were full of people and animals, trapped or killed by falling rubble. Many, including Reverend Davy, headed for the docks where they would be relatively safe from debris. There they beheld a bewildering sight. The Tagus River had receded. They could see the river bottom littered with old shipwrecks. The people had no idea how to interpret this. Tsunamis in the Atlantic are exceedingly rare. Some people even ventured down, hoping to retrieve treasure from the wrecked ships. The tsunami hit at approximately 10 after 10. A wave 12 meters, nearly 40 feet high, came in, as the Reverend described it, like a mountain. So fast that by multiple accounts, people on horseback trying to outrun it had to gallop at full speed. The tidal waves raced up the course of the river and swept away the docks and at least hundreds of people who had sought refuge there. Reverend Davy narrowly escaped, holding onto a huge fallen beam. The water rushed back and then came again two more times. The tsunami was huge. Waves as high as 20 meters hit the coast of Morocco, where as many as 10,000 people were killed. Three meter waves hit the coast of England and Ireland, enough to cause damage. Four meter waves hit islands in the Caribbean. And, a careful review of records reveals, the tsunami reached the coast of Brazil. In 1830, a book was published by Sir Charles Lyell called The Principles of Geology. He commented about this tidal wave, this tsunami, and said the inflowing wave was said to be 60 feet high. Mountains, some of the largest in Portugal, were impetuously shaken, as it were, from their very foundation, and some of them opened at their summits, which were split and rent in a wonderful manner. Huge masses of them were thrown down into the valleys. Flames related to the, them were issued from the mountains. The city had been lit by candle and lamp, and thousands of candles had been lit for All Saints Day. The rubble began to burn. Many fires joined into a single blaze, burning the parts of the city that had survived the earthquake and tsunami, and killing those trapped in the rubble. The fire raged for five days, creating a firestorm, a fire so bad that it creates its own wind. It sucked up so much air that people a hundred yards from the blaze asphyxiated. The destruction was terrible. Among the buildings burned to the ground were the Royal Hospital of All Saints, the largest hospital in Portugal, where hundreds of patients were killed in the blaze. The Opera House was in ruins. The Ribera Palace gutted, and with it was lost the 70,000-volume Royal Library, with hundreds of priceless works of art. 
Original manuscripts and details of early Portuguese explorers like Vasco da Gama were lost. So many records were lost that the entire history of the nation was truncated. Every parish church, convent, nunnery, palace, and public edifice, with an infinite number of private houses, were either thrown down or so miserably shattered that it was rendered dangerous to pass by them. Castor's letter to England described this opulent city, now reduced to a heap of rubbish and ruins. Religious thinkers saw the catastrophe as a repudiation of the science of the age and asserted that it was a divine punishment coming as it did on an important feast day and laying waste to all the great cathedrals of the city. The book Great Controversy described the Lisbon earthquake. Though commonly known as the earthquake of Lisbon, it extended to the greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. It was felt in Greenland and in the West Indies, in the island of Madeira, in Norway and Sweden, Great Britain and Ireland. It pervaded an extent of not less than four million square miles. In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as in Europe. A great part of Algiers was destroyed, <clears throat> and a short distance from Morocco, a village containing eight to 10,000 inhabitants was swallowed up. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing great destruction. The second sign that we read about in our verse is the dark day. That night the moon turned to blood as well. The winter of 1780 was one of the coldest on record in New England. It was also one of the snowiest. The Continental Army, led by George Washington, was encamped in Morristown, New Jersey, and they suffered unspeakable hardships. There were 11 consecutive days of below zero weather in Hartford, Connecticut. It even snowed in New Orleans. All of the rivers, lakes, and harbors of New England were frozen solid. 1780 was an odd year. 1780 was also the year of New England's dark day. On May 18, 1780, the sun was an unusual red color. This was the eve of New England's dark day. A dark cloud bank had obscured the sun. Later that evening, the wind changed from the west to the east, and it brought in a fog bank. As dawn came, the skies were clear. But by 10 a.m., the obscuration had begun. A black mist had blotted out the sun. Morning had surrendered to night. Panic sets in. A sheet of white paper can't be read and blends in with the darkest black velvet. Children are dismissed from school. Workers are sent home from their jobs. Churches begin to fill. Sermons preach that this was God's retribution to the American colonists for trying to disavow their parent land, England, in a war of revolution. That night, it was dark. There wasn't a star in the sky. And suddenly, the black clouds parted, and there was the blood-red moon. The end was indeed at hand. Repent, repent. The next sign that is described in our scripture verse of the sixth seal is the stars falling. In November 13, 1833, there, it is estimated that over 150,000 meteors fell that night, more than 30 per second. It's 3 a.m. on the morning of November 13, 1833, and residents across the eastern United States are awakened by bright flashes in the sky. They rush outside, thinking their homes are ablaze, when suddenly they look up and see that the heavens are on fire. Across the Great Plains, the Sioux tribe saw what they described as a storm of stars, as numerous as raindrops, and they recorded them in pictographs. And throughout the South, 
Slaves and plantation owners come out of their quarters and kneel on the ground with their arms outstretched, praying for divine mercy as the sky seemed to be snowing fire. So after all the hype and hysteria, the event was actually a stunning meteor shower. And November 13, 1833 will be forever remembered as the night the stars fell. While the opening of the sixth seal is about the final stages of the church up until the coming of Jesus, we've seen that there was also some additional historical fulfillments in the 17th to 1800s with the great earthquake, the dark day, the moon turning to blood, as well as the falling of the stars. But while these historical events were significant, they're just a preview of these events repeating in a worldwide scale in quick succession just prior to Jesus returning in the clouds. The description of the opening of the sixth seal includes additional information of just prior to the deliverance of God's people. If you consider the historical events we have talked about as the fulfillment of the first part of the opening of the sixth seal, then we are living in the time period between verses 13 and 14. 12 and 13 reads, And I beheld, when I had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken by a mighty wind. But now notice, that we start talking about other signs that haven't happened yet. You can see clearly that the events described starting at verse 14 have not yet been fulfilled. Starting at verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and rich men and chief captains and the mighty men, every bondman and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the, sitteth on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation six fourteen to 17 This is a sequence of events that will happen just prior to the deliverance of God's people at the end of the time, Jacob's time of trouble. Let's look at the response of those on the earth during Jesus' second coming. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us. You can just imagine the agony, the terror, that would happen at this time. People crying for the rocks to fall on them. That was the response of the unsaved. But here is the response of those who are saved. Isaiah 25, 9. And it shall be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord and we have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What is the difference between these two responses? Sin. Genesis 3.9 talked about Adam and Eve. The Lord called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. Compare the joy of the new earth. Revelation 21, 3 and 4, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. It's going to be an amazing thing when there'll be no more sin, no more sadness, no more death. Just look at your life and, and, and the people that you know. 
We know people who are suffering, people who are ill, people who are are having emotional or uh, family troubles. We know people who are suffering from the sadness of loss of a loved one to death. But when we have this new earth and and we will never again experience sadness, pain, suffering, or loss of any anybody or anything. I'm a creative person. God is the creator, and I believe that because we were made in the image of God, we were we were given some of that creativity. And I'm creative, and I'm looking forward to heaven when, as the Bible says, I'm going to be able to build and not someone else inhabit. I'm going to have the interest, the skills, the time, and the resources to do anything I want. And I won't have to hire someone that that knows how to do it because I'm going to know how to do it. The price of materials isn't going to go up. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to heaven and the new earth, and I hope you are too. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In chapter 24, Jesus outlines more than 20 signs of his return. Isn't that exciting? He loves us so much, he lets us know in advance. The Bible predicts that all nature will be out of control just before the coming of Jesus. We should expect tornadoes, fires, floods, hurricanes, and an epidemic of destruction that we can hardly even imagine. Jesus also warned in Matthew 24, 7, there would be earthquakes. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Well, the National Earthquake Information Center records an average of 20,000 earthquakes every year. That's about 50 a day around our world. There are, however, millions of earthquakes estimated to occur every year that are too weak to even be recorded. Since the turn of the new millennium, it is estimated there have been over 800,000 deaths from earthquakes and related tsunamis. Let's now look at Luke 21, verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. This upheaval in nature would reveal itself in various ways. Hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, floods, and fires would manifest themselves in rapid succession. Jesus' last words to his disciples before ascending back to heaven was something like this. I have to leave you now but not forever. One day I will return, and just before I do, the world will seem as if it is falling apart. Nations will grow angry with each other. Wars will come. Even nature will seem deranged. Earthquakes will escalate in magnitude. There will be infectious outbreaks in epidemic proportions. And when these things begin to happen, the majority of people will be terrified. But my followers, need not be. Indeed, when all of this begins, it is time to look up, for the re their redemption draweth nigh. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And remember, I love you. So the opening of the seals represent the stages of the Church of God through history from the time of Jesus going back to heaven until he returns. We've now looked at the sixth seal. The opening of the seals represent the stages of history, but the history as related to God's church and his people. When Jesus left to heaven, he told his disciples to go evangelize the world with the Great Commission, and they did that, and the church was born, and we have followed these different periods of the ups and downs of the growth of the Christian church through history to our day. But there's one more seal to open, and it's the second coming. It's going to be the best of all. So even though there have been tragedies and martyrs and difficulties through the Christian church era from Jesus' day, he is coming back. And we can look forward to that day and be faithful 
so that we will be part of those who say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us.